decision. Got off school that day. We ended up coming up with dumbass plans. That changed their lives forever. The first thing I heard was gunshots. Who pulled the trigger? These aren't murderers. Our children never hurt anyone. So who did? And why are these teens in prison? Plus, a high school student sneaking into someone else's home with deadly results. The homeowner says he was standing his ground. But was that the whole story? You can't lure someone into your home to try to kill them. Surveillance tapes, interrogation tapes, and an unlikely witness. I was absolutely traumatized. Trespassing or a deadly trap. And college co-eds living their dreams with similar stories to tell. I realized that he was chasing me. And so I just kept ready. He grabbed me by my jaw, and after that, I blacked out. Police reports, You're secret right. tapes, and a harrowing decision. I'm so sorry. No, no one's going to get away with doing this to me. Costly consequences. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Teenagers don't always make the smartest choices. Most of the time, no one gets hurt, but... Sometimes the consequences can be devastating. First, five friends and one really bad decision. As Juju Chang first reported in 2014, it involved the house across the street and a deadly encounter with a neighbor. In an instant, their lives and their small American town were changed forever. I heard a bang, and then uh, I heard another bang, and then I heard a couple more bangs afterwards. This story begins on an afternoon much like any other and ends with a twist no one saw coming. Five young friends gather on this porch and make an impulsive decision. In an instant, one of them is dead and the other's lives shattered. I got off school that day. You know, we ended up talking, coming up with dumbass plan, you know, excuse my language. Blake Lehman is just 16 years old, the oldest of three kids and a sophomore in high school. He was the type of boy that if we were driving down the road and somebody had a flat tire, I was pulling over. He would get out and help. I mean, he was just that type of kid. One of his closest friends is 17-year-old Levi Sparks. They grew up together in the neighborhood. You're what? talking about best friends here that spent, like, every day together. Yeah. <laughs> On this day, Blake and Levi are hanging out with a few of their other friends, including Danzel Johnson. They all kind of ended up together, and it just kept getting stupider, you know? Someone suggests finding a house to rob. They could use some extra cash. When you were scoping out the houses, what were you looking for? An empty house. You know? Why an empty house? It was just a plan to get quick money. It was never a plan to hurt anyone or, you know, to even confront anyone. Were any of you armed? No. After checking a couple of nearby houses, they settle on a home they see every day, the one just across the street. You're convinced nobody's inside. We had not before beforehand, you know, and I mean, not like, not, not, just, not just run the doorbell, not. Levi chooses to stay behind on the porch. And at that point, you didn't say, hey, hey, this fella, is this a bad idea? I could have, but no, I didn't. He says one of the friends asks him to be a lookout. He was uh, like, okay, if anyone comes, call us, and they took off. So when you got into the house, who kicked down the door? Uh, Denzel. There was a boom and my whole house shook. This is the testimony of Rodney Scott, the homeowner. Turns out he was home, upstairs, taking a nap. And how far did you get in? Well, I ran to the kitchen, made it to the bedroom. Bedroom on the ground floor? Yeah, on the ground floor. Yeah. And then what did you hear? Uh, the first thing I heard was gunshots. Fear comes over you, and you don't know if you're going to get hurt or if you're going to get killed. That's when I decided that I was going to fire my gun and try to trap them. As soon as the gunshots started, turn around and run away from the gun. So you were hiding? Yeah, the closet was the only space to go in that room. I was shot as I was entering the closet. Did you know you'd been shot? No. I felt something warm. I came up with a handful of blood. That's when you realized you'd That's been when I realized shot I'd life. shot. That's the out. That's the out. So and the in entry the wound is there. And then Blake realizes something else. Denzel is slumped next to him, shot in the chest, bleeding heavily. He died in your arms? He died in between like right in between me and uh, Jose, like as like we're both right there next to him. And I remember screaming, I'm sorry, and just over and over again. To and, whom were you sorry? Uh, you know, the homeowner just, I was sorry, period, you know. It was a bad situation, I was sorry for it all. 
What started out as a teenage impulse has now left one of them dead. This is when Levi says his friends call him to come to the house for help. I just stepped inside that doorway, having to look over, and the guy was holding a gun at me. And I threw my hands up, and uh, he was already told me to get out of his house, and I said, I'm sorry, and I took off. The terrifying news that there's been a shooting on her street ricochets around the small town. Unable to reach her son, Angie Johnson starts to fear the worst. The rumor was going around the neighborhood, one's passed away, one, you know, one's living, and so it's like I didn't know if mine was alive or not. Angie is getting ready to rush to the hospital when local police tell her Blake's already been treated and released from the hospital. But the relief did not last long. Did you get to see him? No, I never got to see him. Angie soon finds out her 16-year-old son is in police custody. As for best friend Levi, his own mother takes him to be questioned. The police department called me and said they wanted to interview Levi. So I took him in, did his questioning, you know, we, I took him home. If she or anyone thought it was all just a tragic mishap, they were in for a rude shock. They called me and said that he had been arrested for murder. That's right, murder, felony murder, because when someone's killed during certain crimes, in this case burglary, everyone committing that crime can be held responsible, even though none of them pulled the trigger or even had a gun. That was one of the hardest parts about the whole thing was explaining to these kids that they were being charged with murder. They didn't understand. I didn't really comprehend it. I didn't put my mind around what what I was really about to go through. Okay, murder, maybe, okay, they don't, they don't know what happened. You know, maybe they think, we hurt, we hurt him. So my thought was still, okay, it'll get cleared up. But there's no misunderstanding charged as adults. They're all facing the possibility of decades in prison for the death of their friend, even though there was no intent to kill even the guy who was just the lookout. Did it occur to you when your friends were crossing the street that somebody could get killed? No. Due to the simple fact that nobody answered the door, no one was home, so where could the harm be done? These aren't murderers. These are <laughs> our children. These are our kids that made a huge mistake that day, but never hurt anyone. Felony murder is controversial. It's not even on the books in every state. I don't think it was reasonable to expect that they um, would have encountered a homeowner with a gun and that homeowner would have killed one of their colleagues. You break into a home, you home invade a home. Is it foreseeable that somebody's going to get hurt? The answer to that would be yes. Is it foreseeable the homeowner is gonna shoot you? The answer is yes. In this case, the homeowner, Rodney Scott, was never charged with wrongdoing, but he was so haunted by what happened there, he never lived in that home again. One of the four, Jose Quiros, who was just 16 at the time, was afraid of a stiffer sentence. He takes a plea bargain. The other three teenagers will face a jury. When we come back, their future is on the line, and the verdict is in. Oh, the decision was real hard for me. I'm still torn over it. Stay with us. On one day, with one bad decision, the lives of four teenagers in Elkhart, Indiana, were forever changed. Was it worth it? No, absolutely not. They knew they'd made a costly mistake, but no one could imagine how high the price. You feel like it hasn't hit you yet? Yeah, it hasn't hit me yet. Their friend is dead, and they are on trial for felony murder. The trial's starting. What is your thought on how fair or not this charge is? We all should be charged for what we've done that day, but nobody committed murder, so why should we be charged with it? The trial lasts just four days, and the verdict comes after just five hours of deliberation. The teenagers are found guilty of an adult crime. As a prosecutor, I did not want to send many young men to jail, but that very often is the only alternative. And here, you've got a dead body. It was a decision this juror did not make lightly. Age should have been a consideration in this one. You know, for the young kids to not even participate in the shooting and get convicted of it, that's the hard part to, the hard part to swallow. At the sentencing, the teenagers' loved ones react in horror as Levi is sentenced to 50 years in prison. Blake and Anthony Sharp both get 55 years. When the verdict came down, what was your reaction? Um, I was crushed, you know. I didn't kill anyone. 
and now for the rest of my life I'll be labeled you know, a murderer. Their harsh sentences have drawn national attention. I think it's insane. I think it's overkill. And I think it's unjust and needs to be remedied. When I found out, it just totally crushed me. The moms are fighting for that remedy. Appeals have been filed to overturn what they say are unjust and cruel sentences. These kids aren't murderers, and they don't deserve to do 50, 55 years and all that for something they didn't do. While their mothers are fighting on the outside, Blake and Levi are inside, waiting, hoping. Blake is in the juvenile unit. 209. This is your world, basically. Uh, yeah. 2040, the earliest this 17-year-old could get out with good behavior. Unless the appeals can get him out earlier. These kids aren't in here for committing a traffic violation. Most of these kids are in here for serious crimes. They should be punished for those crimes. Blake still holds out hope that he'll be free soon enough to make studying for his GED pay off. Two eggs. He's always into it and he's always asking questions. Blake is about to turn 18 and will soon move over to the adult side of the prison. And I want to make a cake. So You're going to make a cake? Just take like honey buns and stuff like that and squish them and make layer, make a layered cake. But the dangers here are real and present. PIO 1.5, PIO 1. Yeah. There's an incident on the adult side. All traffic weapons team assembled. 31 to K1. I hate hearing that. What is it? Somebody's hurt. When you hear that tone ring out, it's, it gives you chills because it could be you any day. An omen of the dangers Blake could face in the future. Fearing for their son's safety behind bars is another motivator for their mothers as they rally for an appeal. And we want to keep the word out about these boys that are locked up and need our support. T-shirts and bracelets are sold with an ever hopeful eye toward the future. Blake's high school girlfriend refuses to walk away and has enough hope in their future to say yes to a very important question. I actually went over to his grandma's house she said she had a t-shirt for me for the boys and it was actually an engagement ring from Blake which was really awesome. Yeah I've had people ask me like how I do it or it's just I really don't know what to say. I love him and I'm not going to leave him when things get hard. Blake's legal team is ready for a hard fight too. They went in without any weapons. They were hoping to find a house that was empty. They didn't have an intent to kill, in my opinion. I think the argument of just a lay person is, well, those boys shouldn't have been committing burglary in the first place. Right. Yeah. We don't disagree with that. Our point of contention is how much punishment they should receive and what they should be punished for. They were guilty of a burglary, and they should have been punished accordingly. I committed a crime. I committed burglary, you know. Serious things did happen, and that's partly my fault. You know, Danzel's gone, you know. His mom lost a son. I mean, I'm not saying I don't deserve time. Where and, did it all go wrong? Oh, uh, man. I couldn't, you know, I guess just the bad, you know, just not being, being a follower, not a leader, I think. Peer pressure was definitely a play here, a very teenage vulnerability. The juvenile brain continues to develop throughout adolescence, precisely in the areas that govern judgment, the exercise of reasoning, weighing risks. Not everyone believes that's an acceptable excuse. Very often as a prosecutor, I would see, especially teens, when they're in a group, they tend to do things they may not do on their own. Would you feel menaced if you woke up from a sound sleep and you came downstairs and found five men? I think the answer is yes. However, the highest court in the land has already ruled that juveniles shouldn't face the death penalty, nor life without parole, because their brains just aren't fully developed. But even tough-on-crime former prosecutors like Nancy Grace say there were other options. Frankly, the sentence disturbs me. This case could easily have been pled down to a voluntary manslaughter with a sentence of 15 years, and they would have done hard jail time, 7 to 10 years and then still had a life to live. For Blake, life behind bars continues. He's now 18. With no warning, he's told to pack up his things. He's moving to the adult side. Caught me off guard. I was about to go to sleep. The sergeant came and told me, he said, pack your stuff up. They act like they're not scared. They act like they're Superman. But underlying, you can tell by the look in their eyes that they're a little intimidated. I wouldn't say afraid, I'd say anxious. 
it's just the environment. I get put into some crazy plays, and so I'm worried about that. But I think I'll be alright. But while the walk from the juvenile housing unit over to the adult side may be short, it's miles away from the world he's known. And his new cellmate has a few words of advice for the new arrival. Meet a few people, don't meet too many people. And just try to get in time for to go home. His best friend Levi, who stayed back on the porch that day, is already on the adult side. Hanging out with the wrong crowd here will probably get you into a bad situation. What's the hardest part about being locked up? Being behind bars, it ain't nothing like being on the outs. This is constantly what we see every day. This. It's depressing. It's horrible. Show me your ink. All right. Let's see. His time in prison, now literally written on his skin. Tattoos he illicitly got while behind bars. And the hourglass is broken. That will show that it, you're, it's a it's waste of time. And that's your sentence, yeah, 50 years. Sentence. Levi's cellmate is 40 years plus older than he, and doing 65 years. I'm here for the duration. For now, their lives are still on hold. Freedom could still be years away, unless their mother's fight is successful. Today, they've made the five-hour drive to Wabash to see their sons. I feel like if we're not visiting and showing them that we're out here still fighting, still caring, that they're going to lose that hope and that faith. He doesn't know I'm coming, and this is what's even better about it. <laughs> Excitement and emotions bubble up as they arrive, smiling as they walk through a gauntlet of barbed wire. Ooh, I'm so excited. There's Blake. <laughs> oh, oh. Hi, honey. The rules dictate you can only hug at the beginning and end of each visit, and the moms take every effort to make even the slightest contact with their sons. It's also a reunion for Blake and Levi. The two friends haven't seen each other in months. It's good. It's good to see him. You know, good to see he's doing good. I've been trying to send word to him, tell him I say hey, and I love him. Here, honey, you get over on this side. There's time for a quick photograph. They're allowed one per visit. But before they know it, Blake and Levi have to return to the world behind locked doors. All right, bye-bye. I will see you in a couple weeks. Right. Though they can't undo what began on the porch that fateful day, the mothers continue to be mothers. We're going to fight with everything we have. The Indiana Supreme Court later overturned the felony murder convictions of Blake Lehman, Levi Sparks, and Anthony Sharp and instructed the trial court judge to re-sentence them as adults on the charge of burglary, which carries a sentence of 6 to 20 years. Blake and Levi earned their GEDs in prison and, as of 2015, are able to see each other on a daily basis. Blake and Catherine Husky still plan to marry. Up next, a late-night intruder and a deadly encounter. <laughs> But was it random or something far more calculated? He had said he'd been sitting up for three days. When we come back. It seemed clear cut. A family man hears an intruder late at night and, believing the man is armed and dangerous, shoots him dead. But as Deborah Roberts reported, this case is not what it appears to be. And the question would become, was it really self-defense? Montana is the picture-perfect postcard of the American wilderness. Ranches outnumber towns here, and people hunt and fish with enthusiasm. They value guns and their freedom. Even kids as young as 12 learn to load, shoot, and respect the power of a gun. But one spring night in Missoula, in a quiet neighborhood nestled in the mountains, shotgun blast would shatter this community to its core. On the phone, Janelle Flagger calling 911 after her common law husband, Marcus Karma, shot dead a teenager in their garage during the early morning of April 27, 2014. Where is he shot? Um, I don't know what he's doing, The person bleeding to death, 17-year-old Diren Didi, a foreign exchange student from Hamburg, Germany. Didi played soccer at Big Sky High School and, according to friends and teachers, seemed to fit in well in his new American setting. But on the night of the shooting, he entered Karma and Flagger's garage, possibly looking for alcohol. 
Marcus Karma and his young family had moved to the upscale Grant Creek neighborhood a few months earlier. But they quickly found out it wasn't as perfect as it appeared. The couple claims they'd been burglarized twice in the two weeks before the April 27th shooting. They reported the second one to police. No one had been caught. So when Darren Deedy walked into their garage that spring night, Karma and Flacker say they thought the burglars were back. Karma told officers he shot Deedy in self-defense under the Castle Doctrine, which permits homeowners in Montana and other states to use deadly force if they believe there's impending harm or a threat. Certainly it's easy in retrospect to question what other things he could have done, but at that moment, he believed he had no other choice. It seemed an open and shut case, but it would be far from that. The day after the shooting, police arresting Karma for deliberate homicide. The incident, prosecutors allege, wasn't self-defense. Though Didi didn't know it at the time, they say he walked right into a trap. I kind of hear lots of things that show that this case was not justifiable use of force. When the case made it to court, the question for the jury, did Karma truly feel his life and home were in danger? Karma's story is that a surveillance camera alerted him to a man entering the garage, so he grabbed his shotgun and ran outside. He claims he couldn't see inside the darkened garage, but he could hear threatening noises. He feared the intruder would be armed, so he panicked and fired four shots, striking Didi in the arm, then in the head. He had to take the steps, unfortunately, to take his life. But prosecutors say the video clearly shows that Didi wasn't armed. The only thing he was carrying was a light. And that's not all. According to court documents, Karma and Flagger set up a baby monitor in the garage and installed motion sensors. Then they baited the burglar by leaving the garage door open with a purse inside. If they baited him, then he's guilty. Y you can't lure someone into your home to try to kill them in any state with any protective stand your ground or castle doctrine law. The bottom line is you set a trap for someone to come to your house. You're prepared there to shoot and kill that person because you created a trap. That's murder. The prosecution's theory backed up by witnesses from Karma's own community. Neighbors claiming that before the shooting, Flagger openly talked about luring a burglar. She said, oh yeah, he will, he'll be coming back because we are going to bait him. Here, a hairdresser who cut Karma's hair just days before the incident. He had said he's really tired and that he'd been sitting up for three days waiting to shoot some kids. Was Karma hunting for prey? Defense lawyers say no. Instead, they paint a picture of a man suffering from anxiety, tormented by the fear that his young family, already burglarized, had become the target of thieves. His actions fueled, they say, because he believed police weren't doing enough. What other remedy did they have as far as they had to take the law into their own hands, so to speak? The one witness who should have helped Karma most, his common law wife, perhaps doing the greatest damage. Prosecutors deciding to call Janelle Flagger to testify about the night of the shooting. She reportedly told police the teenager cried out, no, no, wait, please, before Karma shot him. Now on the stand, she's saying that didn't happen. I was absolutely traumatized. I mean, I was being asked questions within a half an hour of holding somebody's brain in my hand. As the trial progresses, it becomes clear it isn't just karma on trial, it's the Castle Doctrine itself. Robbie Pasmino, a foreign exchange student who was with Didi that night, says they had no idea that walking into someone's garage could turn deadly. No one told us that you could be shot if you went inside a garage because we don't have that kind of rules in our countries. In Germany, Didi's death took on a life of its own. Hundreds gathered at a memorial service to say goodbye to Didi and demand justice. But back in the courtroom, the case coming down to the life of a teenager tragically cut short. Did he deserve to die for his transgressions? No. For making mistakes teenagers make? No. It would take jurors just eight hours to convict Marcus Karma of deliberate homicide. Find the defendant guilty. For Didi's parents, the conviction brought closure. The jury took its time. I think they did a great job. And at this point, the only feeling is relief. 
and for neighbors in this quiet Montana town, a hope that once again justice and peace will soon return. Marcus Karma was sentenced to 70 years in prison. As of 2015, he plans to appeal his conviction. When we come back, accusations of rape on a college campus. I started screaming, I was like, get off me, please get off me. And I said, I don't want to. And after that, I blacked out. And three women fighting for justice. I am so sorry. No, no one's gonna get away with doing this to me. Stay with us. We've all seen the shocking headlines about rape on college campuses, but you're about to hear the very personal stories of three women who say they were assaulted in one college town. As Juju Chang first reported in 2015, these women refused to remain silent, and they now share the daunting steps taken in pursuit of justice. Missoula, the bucolic college town nestled in the Rockies, known for two towering institutions, the University of Montana and Grizzly football. Touchdown, Montana! There was no other option for school for me. It was, I was going to be a Montana Grizz. Kelsey Belknap was proud of her beloved Grizzlies, a high-octane Division I team whose devout fan base is known simply as Grizz Nation. The big stadium, all the people cheering, I loved it, and it is now ruined for me. Ruined because sophomore year, Kelsey says she was gang raped by four Grizzly players at a drunken party inside this off-campus apartment. I just remember the crotch being in my face and I said, I don't want to, and I pushed him away. He grabbed me by my jaw and after that I blacked out. She came forward with her story. What do we want? What do we want it now? Joining a chorus of alleged victims nationwide, sparking fierce debate over America's campus rape crisis. <laughs> Fueled by binge drinking and sexual aggression, many victims say they feel the justice system, instead of helping, is failing them. Which may be why an estimated 80% of rapes go unreported. I think it's absolutely terrifying to come forward because you're treated not like the victim. How are you treated? Like it was your fault that the rape happened. In the past three years, there have been at least 80 reported rapes in Missoula, at least 11 sexual assaults involving university students Missoula's own brewing rape scandal came to a head in 2012 when the Justice Department launched a federal investigation into the university and the local police and prosecutors. High-profile cases involving Grizzly football players and other UM students made for scandalous headlines, and the media pounced, dubbing Missoula America's rape capital. There's Zootown for mm -hmm. Missoula and Grizzlyville. The stories caught the attention of investigative journalist and best-selling author John Krakauer. Missoula is not the rape capital of the country. I wish it was. I wish this was a unique problem. It's rape statistics are about average or a little below. Krakauer is perhaps most famous for his non-fiction survival adventure classic, Into the Wild, which Hollywood later turned into a movie. You are a big deal if you're on the Grizz. But he's taking on an entirely different struggle with his new book, Missoula, Rape and the Justice System in a College Town. If this problem could exist in Missoula, it could exist anywhere in the country, and it does. My book focuses on the victims, their ordeal, you know, what they went through. Once you get to know the victims, it's, not, it's a huge price these victims pay. He did something to me that I have to work on every day, and that I'm probably going to have to work on for the rest of my life. Allison Huguet is the first of five alleged victims Krakauer started profiling three years ago. Like eight out of every ten college-age rape victims, she knew her assailant personally. Star grizzly running back Bo Donaldson was a hometown hero and her close childhood friend. And this is somebody who I looked at as a protector somebody who I thought would have protected me from anything. She'd left Montana for college, but returned home to Missoula for a party at Donaldson's house in September 2010. Do you remember how much you were drinking? It wasn't an excessive amount. It was just more socially throughout the whole night I've been drinking. So neither of us were in any condition to drive. So at about two in the morning, Allison decided to crash on the couch. I woke up to a lot of pain and a lot of pressure and sound of somebody moaning and quickly realized it was Bo. And then I just shut my eyes and laid there. And that wasn't, I don't even think, a decision I consciously made. And I waited until he was done. And he got up and he literally picked up a blanket and threw it on me. 
and then pulled up his pants and walked away. Some people would say, well, why didn't you scream out? Why didn't you fight back? This person is already willing to rape you. It's hard to imagine what they would wouldn't do, you know, what they wouldn't do to stop you from telling people. Allison waited silently until Bo was out of earshot and then frantically snuck out of the house barefoot. I ran out the back door, down the driveway, and then through this alleyway up here. She desperately dialed her mom for help. And she just kept telling me to run. I remember telling her that Bo had raped me, and then I realized that he was chasing me. And so I just kept running and pushing him off of me. Allison says Bo was begging her to come back, to not tell anyone, but he finally let her go. It was such a state of shock. I just need to get away from him and to somebody that was gonna get me to a safe place. She went to the hospital and had a rape kit exam, but she didn't want the police involved. I knew that going forward with that would be a huge ordeal and him playing for the Grizz maximized it by 100. Instead, she decided to do her own detective work. The morning after, as miserable as she was, she and her friend decided, you need to get a confession. You need to tell Bo that if he doesn't come and apologize tomorrow morning, you're going to go to the cops. So she invited Bo over to her mom's house and hid an audio recorder between the couch cushions. I'm so sorry we were laying on the couch. I, I was obviously completely f up. I've heard stories before about how hard it is um, to charge somebody with rape and and in general I just didn't want to be questioned. We were making out on the couch, we were laying in on the couch together, we started doing stuff. No, we weren't, Bo. I never ever once remember ever making out with you or any of that. Bo eventually changed his story. Oh, you took complete advantage of me. I did. The only reason oh, I, I did. I'm the only sorry. reason I even felt comfortable sleeping there is because I've known you since the first grade. That's not me. Bo was emotional, and Allison thought genuinely remorseful. I just felt killed myself that night. <laughs> I was curled up on the couch in the carport with my handgun in my hand. You have no idea. Allison made Bo promise to get help. In return, she said she wouldn't call the police. If you had done this to some random girl, and she walks down to the police station and tells them, your whole life is ruined, Bo. You're going to jail. Can't you just see the Missoulian? The other grizzly football player in trouble. Pretty screw up. More than a year passed, and she was still plagued by nightmares and anxiety. I started acting crazy. <laughs> My mind feeling crazy. I wanted to pay people to hurt him, and that's not my normal character. She says she knew Bo wasn't getting the help he'd promised to seek, so she finally called the cops. They arrested Bo, got their own videotaped confession, and the wheels of justice began turning very slowly. If you didn't have two taped confessions, how difficult a case would yours have been, do you think? Very difficult. That would be my word. Again, says. In the meantime, the local paper reported on two other alleged incidents of rape by grizzly football players, including Kelsey Belknap's alleged gang rape. I was in a relationship, lived with someone. I never once walked in there saying, hi, this is the first night that I've met you. Now please have sex with me. Kelsey was celebrating the end of finals with drinking games at that off-campus party in December 2010. She said she took 8 to 11 shots of 99-proof alcohol within an hour. And the next thing I know, I'm in a bedroom. I don't remember bits and pieces until I had a penis in my face. She told police she pushed the first player away, saying, I don't want to, but he forced himself on her. What followed, she says, was a gang rape by three additional Grizzly football players. Is there a possibility that they thought you were consenting? I don't know what they're thinking. I'm not a mind reader. Do they know what I was thinking? Kelsey went to the hospital. Hours later, she still had a blood alcohol level nearly three times the legal limit. She immediately called the police, but she says she was surprised by their reaction. When I left the police department, I walked away feeling like it was 100% my fault. Why? They made it seem like it was alcohol, that it was my fault that I had drank too much, and if I wouldn't have drank too much, it wouldn't have happened. And do you feel that's true now? Absolutely not. Alcohol didn't stick a penis in my face. It was the people that did that.
When we come back, nothing will stop Kelsey from pursuing justice. Not even the cops telling her that her own words just might sink her case. As for Allison, she uncovers an explosive new detail. She may not have been Bo's first victim. I started screaming. I was like, get off me. Please get off me. And I was pinned down. I, there was no way I could get up. Stay with us. I felt so violated. I was like, no, no one's going to get away with doing this to me. It had been two months since Kelsey Belknap says she was gang raped by four University of Montana football players at a drunken off-campus party inside this apartment. Just how incapacitated do you think you were? I was so drunk, I don't, I don't even remember what was going through my mind. The last thing I remember is saying, I need to get the hell out of here, and I couldn't move. She told police she resisted at first. But after an investigation, detectives and prosecutors determined there was not probable cause to file criminal charges against anyone involved in the incident. Case closed. What was your reaction? I was shocked. I was like this, you know, I kind of had thought to myself, this is a slam dunk case. This is the Missoula police report. A case that highly acclaimed author John Krakauer followed through every twist and turn in his new book. Any of the boys or the girl that was in the situation said is all covered up. <laughs> But investigators pointed out that a crucial part of Kelsey's own testimony was working against her. On the question of consent, Kelsey told police that the men would have likely believed it was consensual sex. Kelsey stated she was so intoxicated she did not resist them. What's more, all four Grizzly players involved in the incident and two additional witnesses told police that they thought the sex was consensual. The cop who investigated the detective, it, he told her, you know, Kelsey, it's your word against six people. How am I supposed to work with that? Montana law states a victim is incapable of giving consent if they're mentally defective or incapacitated, but the definition of incapacitation is murky. And the county attorney insists that despite being extremely drunk, Kelsey was not legally incapacitated. The cops and prosecutors said, well, if she'd been out cold, yeah, you'd have a case. But because she was in and out of consciousness, she could have given consent. That's horse shit. I mean, that is just, that is ridiculous. Prosecutors considered all this evidence as insurmountable hurdles in Kelsey's case, even though she told police that she was afraid to fight back. I was scared because these boys were a lot bigger than me. It didn't matter how hard I would have fought. The Montana State Attorney General's Office agreed with the local prosecutor's decision not to file charges in Kelsey's alleged gang rape. But the Federal Justice Department found that cases like Kelsey's were part of a pattern. They said the county attorney declined to prosecute nearly every case where the assault was facilitated by drugs or alcohol, even when the assailant had confessed. They also found that over the course of four and a half years, prosecutors filed charges in only 14 of the 85 total rape cases that police sent them. They have never before done this to any prosecutor. The Missoula County attorney at the time strongly disputed the DOJ's findings and defended their record, saying their rape prosecution stats are on par with some other major cities. That's what's so insidious, and I think this is true in most cities, most cities. So the prosecutor puts out this message, we're just not going to do it unless it's so glaringly obvious that we have to do it. After Kelsey hit a dead end with police and prosecutors, she turned to the university for justice. Of the four football players, one was expelled, one agreed to leave, and two had already left school before the university could take action. What goes through your mind as you walk down this alley? Um, I think it's surreal because I don't, you know, for me it was dark and I don't recall a lot of this. Meanwhile, it had been nearly two years of anxiety and anger since Allison Huguet was raped by star running back Bo Donaldson. But after a secretly recorded audio confession and police investigation, Bo still was not behind bars. Then a stunning twist. He came in pulled down shorts and pulled down his underwear and just got right on top of me. Hillary McLaughlin, a woman who says she too was sexually assaulted by Bo Donaldson two years before Allison's attack, but she never reported it to police. Does it occur to you what might have happened if you had come forward and tried to press charges? It kills me because I could have possibly prevented what Allison went through. And that brings a lot of guilt. Her life could have been so differently if I would have been able to have the courage to say, this person was wrong and this person tried to hurt me and he needs, something needs to be done about it. When Allison found out about Hillary, she tipped off detectives and they convinced her to tell her story in court. That was huge. It puts a lot more doubt on his stories and gives me a lot more credibility. 
That was huge. In September 2012, Bo pled guilty to Allison's rape. The front page story divided Grizz Nation. Tell me about the backlash for people who come forward and report rapes. It's awful. People are awful. <laughs> she just kept crying. In court, Bo had to listen to gut-wrenching statements from Allison and her loved ones. She couldn't even talk. She just cried. I just said that I thought he deserved to be raped every day until he could understand what he was putting me through. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. I think we all have this misconception that a rapist is somebody wearing a ski mask and carrying a weapon. Bo is a rapist. That's what a rapist looks like. And honestly, to me, the ones that look like Bo are a lot scarier because you're a lot more likely to let your guard down. In the wake of the DOJ investigation, Missoula police and the county attorney went beyond the federal requirements, forming special victims units with dedicated police and prosecutors who employ an improved approach to sexual assault cases, especially those involving drugs and alcohol. But Krakauer's book has opened old wounds in Missoula. At a press conference today, the current county attorney, Kirsten Pabst, who Krakauer criticizes in the book, shot back at the author. While the charges that the author has made against me, my office, my predecessor, are inaccurate, exaggerated, and unnecessarily personal, he is correct in that our investigation and prosecution standards needed to be improved. As for the university, among a host of other reforms, the athletic department created a new code of conduct that directly addresses sexual assault. Missoula is a much safer place for women now than it was when I first started looking at it in 2012. But for Krakauer, the most important outcome of shining a spotlight on Missoula, he says, is that it finally gave victims a voice. More and more women are seeing their strength in numbers. You know, the rapist's greatest weapon that they use against victims is silence. I'm sick of being silent. And I feel like I can be a voice for so many people who don't have that chance to be that voice for themselves. As of 2015, Bo Donaldson remains in prison. He's eligible for parole after serving two and a half years of his 10-year sentence. I'm John Quinones. Please join us.